program will begin in approximately seven minutes. Please direct your attention to the stage as the Lubbock Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 2466 assembles the Soldier's Cross. You would join me in prayer. Good and gracious God, it seems that we are standing on sacred ground. The form of these rocks together jettison to the sky to provide visual, and for this we give our thanks. But what seems more holy are these people. What seems more admirable are those who consider the well being of others greater than their own. May this be holy ground inasmuch as honors your love, your protection, and your comfort, O oh God. We pray that this beautiful monument inspire us to continue to pray, to love, to support those who have given in monumental proportion. For those who don a purple heart, for those who know the weight of a gold star to be greater than the sum of all of these rocks, we send our love, we give our gratitude, we commit to prayer and friendship and we pray that we have the strength to live in such a way honoring of those who have given so much. In the name of true love and grace and healing, we pray together. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Maxwell. Good morning. Welcome to Hunnicky Park, where it's a great day in Lubbock, Texas. Thank you for attending the unveiling ceremony of the Monument of Courage. 
which, which honors our region's 12 Medal of Honor recipients, our Purple Heart recipients, our Gold Star families. All gave some and some gave all. My name is Steve Massengale. I serve on the city council for the city of Lubbock and I'll be your MC for the day. Why August 7th and why 912? Today, August 7th is a very special day. It is National Purple Heart Day. Those brave Americans that wear the scars of battle, they are our combat wounded, our Purple Heart recipients. We thank you, we honor you, we salute you. The 12th minute of the hour, it is in honor of our region's 12 Medal of Honor recipients whose courage under fire went above and beyond the call of duty. We ask the families of our Medal of Honor recipients to please stand and raise your hands, if you're able. Thank you. for sharing your loved ones with us. We're extremely grateful for their sacrifice and we'll, we will make it our mission to never forget. Ladies and gentlemen, please set your watches. At exactly 10 a.m., the West Texas Warbird Flight will execute a flyover to honor missing in action Medal of Honor recipient from the Korean War, U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel George A. Davis. At this time, I'd like to introduce Danny Cox. Danny was going to introduce our special guest. I believe we have uh, Senator Charles Perry, uh, Congressman Conaway, and Representative John Frulo. And we apologize if we missed anybody else. Thank you again. Those of you, thank you again for joining us as we honor the sacrifice. Lady, ladies and gentlemen, the Honor Guard from Lubbock's Veterans of Foreign Wars Part Post 2466. Leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance this morning are Cub Scouts from Pack 151. A Pledge of Allegiance. A Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you guys. Very well done. Let's give a hand to PAC 151. As I try to one hand this mic here. You may take your seats. Welcoming everyone this morning is our county judge, Curtis Parrish from the Lubbock County Commissioner's Court. Judge. Thank you, Council Member. On behalf of Lubbock County, I want to welcome you all to this great event today. Two years ago, Lubbock County was named a Purple Heart County, and it's because directly of the effort of many of you in this audience. Uh, Danny Koch and, and those who, uh, and Steve Owen, but uh, to see your faces. Now, my father has passed, but I can look out here and I can see through your faces, I can see my father and the fathers who have gone before us. Every day I walk out of my office at the Lubbock County Courthouse and right behind my office there in the hallway is a large bronze marker that lists the names of those who died in World War I and in World War II. And occasionally I will stop and read those names. Those names 
while now gone some now a hundred years, are still part of who we are in Lubbock, Texas. I am very proud to be here in Lubbock. I'm very proud of this community. And I'm very honored to be a part of the unveiling of this monument today, to honor those who still carry the scars of war, not just on their bodies, but certainly on their souls and their hearts. We, we also honor those who carry the scars of war, who miss their loved ones, who did not return. So at this time, I would like all those who are Gold Star family members, Gold Star meaning those who've lost a loved one in war action. If you are a Gold Star family member, would you please stand, have us acknowledge you right out here. Thank you for your sacrifice, your sacrifice. Thank you. But today is Purple Heart Day. And we unveil this monument today. And at this time, I would like all of those who served our country, who received a Purple Heart, if you would please stand at this time and let us acknowledge you as well. Thank you. These moments in Lubbock's history, in our community's history, are very special. So I would like for all of you to kind of bind your heart around at, at your community who gather together to continue to honor those who have served us, who continue to serve us. For all of you, I say, the only two words that I can pull out of my heart is just to say, thank you. Thank you. May God bless you all. Thank you, Judge. Very appropriate comments. Before we move on in our program, I think it's appropriate to thank those that organized this effort. Really three guys, Benny Guerrero, Steve Oyen, and uh, Danny Koch and their clan, more than three actually, but to, to come to the city of Lubbock and, and tell us they have a dream, and a lot of people come to the city and, and have a dream, but few go out and raise the dollars and make it happen. And um, this park happens to be in my districts, in my neighborhood. I spend a lot of time at this park. And this park is so important to the citizens of Lubbock and to the citizens of West Texas as they come to honor those who have sacrificed. So. Uh, as you see those guys today, thank them for their tireless work because the result is, is amazing. Uh, next up is our commander of the Military Order of the Purple Hearts, U.S. Marine and Vietnam veteran, Steve Owen. Commander Owen is one of the people I've just mentioned responsible for making this all possible. Steve. It's nice out. Uh, Christopher Beck, if you could make your way up here, please. And while he is coming up here, I'd like to uh, recognize Commander Don Roden from Amarillo. He's the chapter, uh, Purple Heart chapter commander up there. Don, thank you for coming down. This young man, many years ago, came up with a dream of constructing a Purple Heart Monument here in Henneke Park. He was an intern for an architect firm. He came up with all the plans and he presented them uh, to us. And so uh, we decided to chase that dream. But over the years and the uh, significant cost of between these two monuments, uh, it was modified a little bit uh, to see what you have today. There's three monuments there, one for Purple Heart recipients, one for Gold Star families, and one for Medal of Honor recipients. And the purple thread of the Purple Heart binds them all together. And so, Chris, I'd like to recognize you with a presentation of a uh, book. It's called Forged in Fire. 
and it's the saga of Hershey, you know, Medal of Honor recipients. And Hershey lives in New Mexico and couldn't be here, and so he asked me to uh, present this to you. I also have a plaque, and it's a plaque from the VFW Post, Chapter 0900, and the Friends of the Monument, and it reads, the military order the Purple Heart Distinguished Service Award is bestowed with pride to Christopher Beck for your initial plan and inspiration for the Regional Monument of Courage, which honors and remembers our veteran heroes and their Gold Star families. And so, Christopher, uh, you're always in our hearts anyway, uh, and thank you for all you've done for our city here and for the vision to have this here, and we appreciate that. Hey, would you like to say a couple words? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. He uh, chose not to say any uh, words. That's that's fine. I have another plaque here, and uh, the the friends of the monument. Uh, we reach out all the way down to Midland and Odessa, and we've held banquets down there as fundraisers for our monument here, as well as the renaming of the veterans. Uh, administration clinic in Odessa to have it renamed to the Wilson and Young VA uh, clinic and so that change is in the works the signs are being uh, produced and Wilson and Young are two of the Medal of Honor recipients over here on our monument both are from Odessa one went to Permian High School the other Odessa High School and so Congressman, we have a plaque here for you and I apologize, it's in the mail someplace, so this is a likeness of it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Steve, I appreciate Please. that. You bet. It says, says the Military Order of the Purple Heart Distinguished Service Award is bestowed with pride to Congressman Mike Conway for your initial plan and inspiration for the Regional Monument of Courage, which honors and remembers our veterans, heroes, and their gold star families. He's been a behind-the-scenes workhorse for us, but whenever we needed help, he and his staff, they were right there, and they, they helped get things done. And so, sir, I salute you, and thank you, and we will, we will deliver your plaque to your office. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Freedom is not free. Less than 1% of Americans wear our country's uniform those brave Americans bear the responsibility of protecting the other 99%. We, see, we send these brave Americans across the world to protect Americans' interests abroad, to defend our freedoms and to keep our enemies from our shores. Today we're joined by musician and songwriter Russ Murphy. Russ has been with the Friends of the Monument from the very beginning, and he's done a great job of telling the story through music. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome singer and songwriter Russ Murphy. I echo the saying of honored to be here today with you. Over the past years, I've worked with thousands and thousands of soldiers and veterans and their families and many Purple Hearts. And when I would try to thank the Purple Hearts for what they had done for me, they said the same thing every time I was just doing my job. And I'm going to tell you, we thank you for that. David Spears, who helped me write this song, uh, got exposed to COVID last week, so he's in quarantine down in post right now. But David Spears did a good job. I'm not sure how much you can hear the guitar, but listen to the words of just doing my job. Veterans Day in 98, on my morning run, saw an old man on his porch in his military uniform. Saw him limp as he tried to raise his flag. He needed help and as he leaned on his cane. Introduced myself. I went by the next week. It became my routine. We talk about life, talk about love, and everything in between. But when I asked about his leg, he said it's no big deal. Well, I got hurt. While I worked at a place called Fort Chuck And he said, all gave some and some gave all 
proud to take a stand when duty calls. The currency of freedom is a soldier's blood. A son, I ain't no hero. Just doing my job. One day I noticed that purple heart he wore. He said, it's what they give you when you're wounded in the war. Every name fell at my feet on that awful day. Well, I just took some shrapnel, but it blew my buddy away. Well, he said, all gave some, some gave all. Proud to take a stand when duty calls. Is a soldier's blood. A son, I ain't no hero. Just doing my job. Stopped by last Wednesday. Doc Johnson's car was there. He said, Your friend's almost gone. He'll be glad to know you're here. The old man took me by the arm and he said, it means so much to me, for all these years you've been my friend. And he gave his purple heart to me. <laughs> he said, all gave some and some gave all, proud to take a stand when duty called. The currency of freedom is a soldier's blood, son ain't Just doing my job. Oh, just doing my job. Thank you for doing your job. Thank you, Russ. Beautiful song. Let's give Russ another round of applause, can't we? Next in our program, I'd like to introduce the president of Texas Tech University, Lawrence Skuvenek, to introduce our first speaker. Lawrence. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce Melissa Gensch. Before I do, I also want to express on behalf of the entire Texas Tech University community, our deep sense of gratitude and appreciation for all those who have served and who serve our country today. I also want to say thank you to the Friends of the Monument, people like Danny Koch, for their efforts in making this possible, a chance to honor those who have received the Purple Heart and we're very proud and at Texas Tech, our alumni include two Medal of Honor recipients. In 2014, Texas Tech was the first university in this state to be given the Purple Heart designation, and we think that reflects a sense of values and culture that's consistent with those of you here today and those who have helped to make this monument possible. Uh, and now to introduce Melissa Ginch. Melissa Ginch was seven years old as she watched her father be presented the Medal of Honor for his bravery and heroism during the Vietnam War. And until his death in 2009, she remained very close to her father, maintaining that close relationship that began as a child and serving as his confidant throughout his life. She helped care for him in the last months of his life and became the one he chose to speak for him upon his death. Even though her father lived all over the world, Texas was always considered his home base thanks to his strong family relations here. Since her father's death, Melissa has been privileged to speak on numerous occasions regarding his time in the service, as well as his being interviewed on, for several news stories and the award-winning KWTX documentary, We Can't Forget Vietnam. 
She was a guest of honor at the Army Aviation Association Hall of Fame ceremony when her father was inducted and was the guest of honor speaker when the 5th Special Forces Headquarters at Fort Campbell, Kentucky was named Howard Hall in her father's honor. In 2014, Melissa received the Bull Simon Award, the U.S. Special Operations Command highest honor on behalf of her father. In 2019, she again represented her father as he was inducted in the Commando Hall of Fame at the United States Operations Command Headquarters at MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. It's my honor to introduce Melissa Howard Ginch. I'm gonna start off by saying what my father would want me to say. And also, this pin that I have on my shoulder, that is from I'm an honorary member of the 93rd chapter of the Special Forces Operation in Waco, Texas, and on behalf of them and my father, and with all the respect that I can muster, I wanna say thank you for allowing me to share in this moment. I was asked to tell a story. You see, last night we were talking and Danny said something about stories. We all tell stories, which it made me smile because my husband will tell you, I say that all the time. I say that my father gave me the command to be the book holder of his story. And I would say with Danny, Steve, and Benny, they have to be the head librarians on this whole thing, on opening up where these Gold Star families can come and share the story of their family member. I met a lady last night who her son She'd lost her first son. Her, her next son, Zeke, is going to join the Army. And um, I just wanted to say our prayers will be with you forever and ever. Who is Colonel Robert L. Howard? Let me open my book. Let me tell you his story. He served five tours of duty. His one was never enough. He was... He was awarded the Medal of Honor. He was nominated three times, but they can only give it to you once. And the places he was in the first two times, the government didn't want the United States to know about. And in fact, it wasn't until I was at Fort Campbell speaking that they spoke of where he had been. So they had brought those down to Silver Stars. He has eight purple hearts. He was wounded 14 times. But he said those others didn't count. And it's, it's funny, you know, he always told me that it was the Purple Heart that he cherished the most. And so I'm going to tell that story first on how he came to be and, and why. He was born in Opelika, Alabama, very small, small country town in the middle of nowhere. Got to think he was born in 1939. His father had served in World War II. You know, we talked about the ramifications of those that serve. It's either going to make you or break you. And unfortunately, with my father's father, my grandfather, it broke him. My father never, ever spoke an ill word. But he told of the hardships. They were poor, beyond poor. They used to say that and excuse this, this slang, but they were white trash. My father's grandmother tried to hold the family together, as so many women do, and his father was an alcoholic. My father didn't judge because he kind of he knew his father had, had seen and done things. And as he was growing up, he became the defender of his sisters and his younger brothers. It came to a head one night when he walked in and he found his father getting physical with his sister. And my father stepped in and he took him to the wall and his grandma came in and she said, Robert, she says, don't ever show disrespect 
to your elder. And he looked at her and she said, unless you have a reason to. And he said, I have a reason. And he kept that with him. He used to, he used to watch. If you know where Alabama and Opelika is, there's a highway near there. And it's like not too far from Fort Benning. And with, with his father and his determination of, of learning to just work for everything he could get. He used to see these paratroopers driving by, and he, that's all he wanted to do. So he told his father, even before he graduated high school, he said, I'm joining up. And his father said, no, you're not. His father told him, he goes, you're not man enough. And my father said, I will learn to be man enough. And he signed up, and his first Purple Heart, he said it was sort of humorous to him because he had so, he had trained and he was all ready, you know, he was ready to go in. He went through airborne training, kept waiting. He got called into Vietnam and he said he was on a boat ride. So for all you Navy people, kudos to you. He described it as 31 days of hell. He said after 17, they had to take hard water salt baths to conserve the water. And when they finally landed on, landed on the beach, they had, you know, to jump in and they jump in. He, he kept thinking in his head, you know, that he was going to drown before he even stepped foot <laughs> to help fight in this war. They get on and for weeks he said that they were disoriented. They never saw any Viet, Vietnamese. They didn't know. All the men were wondering. They were young, just like this young man Zeke is, young. They don't understand fully. They're just ready to go. Well, they finally get sent in, and it was about, he said it was late at night by the time they got the perimeter set up, that they had put these large tents up, and they were getting starting to get fired at. And all those young men with them, they realized, this is real. This is happening. They get called on. My dad went up to his lieutenant, and he said, getting fired on. Give me a location, give me, tell me, give me a location, I'll defend it, I'll set it up. So as he's going to do that, that's when they got ambushed. And he, he said all he remembers at first was this, like that he was just exploded backwards. And he landed, when he landed, he knew that there was soft ground there and he, he laid back and he's trying to push up but he couldn't see because blood was running down his face. See, what had happened, he'd gotten shot in the face and it had gone through one jaw and out the other. And all he could see was just blood and he was scared. And he, when he put his hand back, he felt a body. And he shuddered and it was dark and he looked and he realized they were in a cemetery. And he said two words. Second word was SH, won't go on with that. And he realized there was this body that they were in this cemetery and these were Vietnamese. They stand, they bury their dead upright. And this corpse, he said, all he could think about was the maggots that he saw and the smell. And he just kept thinking, Lord, Lord, what I do? And it came to him, keep moving. My father at that time, he didn't know if his face was blown off. He said he was scared to touch it, that it was his first time to feel real fear. And that's when he learned to face that fear. And he said he had to keep moving. So he kept moving. And when they got him back and he was evac and he was being taken care of and they were reconstructing his jaw and trying to get him stable and everything, he was next to a special forces guy. And the special forces guy, when his colonel came in, he told that colonel, he goes, this is one we need. And the colonel, he talked to my father, and after talking to him, he said, yeah. He said, you are one of us. And then before my father knew it, he was Mac V. Sog. He didn't know. He said all he knew it was special. <laughs> he wasn't for sure. Didn't know where he was going, what he was going to do. And that was his first journey. And see, the scar on his face from that first Purple Heart, that reminded him that he was human, to stay humble, that there were those, he was given a chance 
to keep going, keep moving. And with the first occurrence with his Medal of Honor, he learned a lesson that I think he's, he decided to spend the rest of his life as so many of these men have done in spreading and, and talking to the young genera the next generation. He was sent to Hantum and they were sent in. There had been a platoon that had gone out in Laos and they had broke communication. The last communication they had been given from them was them saying they were being captured, they were being tortured, they were being killed. And it was silence. It's not normal. They knew that was not normal. They told my father, they said, get your group together, you go get them. My father said, yes, sir. And he went. On that field, when they went in, they had to land. They had to, and as soon as they were landing from the helicopter, they were receiving fire. And getting off the helicopter in the landing zone, they were receiving fire. My father, he took three men. It was him and three men. They tried to head out to fight their way through. They couldn't get through. After my father killed many Viet Cong, he made it back. Out of those three, my father was the only one who made it back. And he told him, he said, we've got to get back out there. Number one, we've got to get those we were sent to do, to bring back home. He said, and we've got to go back and get those that we've lost just now. But they couldn't get loose. They were receiving all this firepower. They were, surren they were surrounded. My father said, well, you know, we've just got to fight it out. He was finally able, his lieutenant said, let's get this group. We're going to have them cover us here and then through. There was about 12, 13 of them. Some of them were Vietnamese Special Forces indigenous folk that were working with them, with our government. So they head out and ride out. My father, he was to hold up the rear. And he said he kept getting, he kept thinking something was wrong. He kept thinking something was wrong. And as he starts to make his way to the front, to the young lieutenant, to tell him he felt they were going to be ambushed. Right at that moment, they were. My father was blown up to bits. He said he woke up when he came to. He couldn't feel his hands. He couldn't see from the blood. He couldn't move his hands. He said he looked further and he saw the lieutenant. He could hear the lieutenant. He knew he was still alive. My father kept thinking again, Lord, give me the will. He said he felt fear like he'd never felt before. And as he's trying to get up, he sees a Viet Cong coming and he sees him with a flamethrower. He said the stench was something that permeated through his nose and that he would never, ever forget. And what these Viet Cong were doing were they were burning all the bodies. My father is just through the will and the grace of God. He kept thinking he had to get that lieutenant. And the one Viet Cong starts coming towards him. And he passed the lieutenant. He's heading towards my father. My father thought at that time, he thought, he thought I don't want to go this way. He said, I want to go out on my own terms. And he pulls a grenade. And all his ammunition had been blown away, but he had a grenade. And so he's trying to, he couldn't, his fingers had actually, I mean, they'd been burned, they'd been broken to bits. He was able, with one thumb, to get that pen out. And he's holding it. And he said in his eyes, he was remembering all that he'd gone through as a child. And he kept remembering his father not supporting him. And he kept thinking, I can do this. But if you're going to take me, it's going to be on my terms. And he looked that Viet Cong. And he looked back at him. He said there was something in their eyes. It's like they both could see this anger, this strength, almost like an evil that my father used to say. Because he used to say he ran with the devil, but God had his back. Miss Viet Cong, he turned around and started going the other way. My father's thinking, holy heck, I've got this grenade. <laughs> He's like, 
and he starts to throw it at him to, to blow him up. And he thought, no, he respected me. And he knew there was some more off over in the field. So he throws it over there and he blows them up. And so he starts dragging. His legs were burnt, as I said. He was, it, it was horrible. He said the pain was worse than he'd ever felt in his life. So he starts crawling over to his lieutenant. So that's all he could think about. He said, we've got to get him. We've got to get him. And he looks back, and unfortunately, he sees one man, another sergeant, who's sitting there, armed, not doing anything, just sitting there. He saw three others, and my father's like, I gotta do it. He goes over there, and he gets the lieutenant, and he starts trying to drag him back down the hill. And he starts getting fired on again, gets blown up again, if you can believe it. He gets the, the lieutenant, he gets into where the one sergeant was, and he told him, he said, damn it, he said, you give me, you give me a weapon. If you're not going to do it, you give me a damn weapon. And he said that they had words. And this sergeant starts backing up because he had fear, and he hadn't learned to turn that fear at that moment. The sergeant wouldn't give him a weapon. My father starts going after him again, trying to get to him. He throws him a 45. Right at that time, my father turned, and he could hear more coming. There was a Viet Cong right there, fixing to spear him. My father shot him, fell over backwards, covering the lieutenant. And that's when that sergeant then picked up and started firing. So then he's still trying to drag this lieutenant off. And one of the Viet, Vietnamese Special Forces men, as my father's hollering, trying to get his lieutenant, his job to get that lieutenant down there, to get him safe. This Vietnamese that Special Forces that was, was trying to get to him, he turns to come hell and he gets killed. My father, somehow, he doesn't know how, he got down to the hill. And when he wakes up, he asks, the first thing he asks is, the lieutenant alive? The medic told him, said, he's alive, but he not, he, he's probably not going to make it. My dad said, you better make him make it. He said, we're not going to lose him. And my father started from that bed. He said, he said, get me a radio, get me a transmitter. He said, we've got to get these men. We've got to get them, no matter what it cost. So what he did, so he, then he called in. What they had to do was the air control. He called in a ring of fire because they were surrounded, and he had to keep them away till they could get helicopters in so then that they could get all these dead soldiers, wounded soldiers, the few that were alive out. So as I said, he called in this ring of fire. Finally, they were able to get through. And he said that he found out later that airmen volunteered to go in to save them. They weren't told. They volunteered on their own to go in to save these men. And he told, he told them on the radio, usually the norm is that you get those that are injured and alive out first. My father said, hell no. He said, we're getting all these dead men. He said, we're getting these bodies on these helicopters and we're getting them out of here because these families deserve it. Their families deserve to have their bodies, to pay their respects. They were able to get one helicopter in. My father made sure they were loaded. There wasn't room for him. He said, that's fine, he would wait. And he had the lieutenant with him. And by the time the helicopter got down, when they're getting up there, getting him and the lieutenant in, the lieutenant died. My father said at that moment, when he thought he had felt the pain of getting blown up at that first time, that that was pain, but that wasn't the pain. The pain was the loss of that lieutenant. And all he could think about were the families 
And I'm going to say right now, I'm going to blame. If I have tears in my eyes, it's due to the sun. That's my excuse. That's all I'm going to say. But so when he was awarded the Medal of Honor, he said at first that he didn't deserve it because in his mind, he did not get that lieutenant back alive. Then he realized later that when he wore that medal, he said he wore it not for himself. He said that he wore it for all those men, all those soldiers that never came back. You know, last night, my youngest daughter, Isabella, over here, she listened to these stories because that's what we are. We're storytellers, and we have to keep these stories going. We have to. When my father was asked, you know, why? That's why. For you men and women. And you know, for freedom, as my daughter was telling me last night, she said, you know, these military men and women, they did it for her generation, for the next generation. And you know, I'm proud to see, because you see, we have the freedom to choose. I give you the right, if you don't want to stand and show honor to our flag, that's your choice. But damn it, I'm going to stand and I'm going to show respect. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks for being in Lubbock, Texas and sharing your story with us today. It's my priv privilege and pleasure to introduce Russ Murphy again. Russ, you're up. Ladies and gentlemen, singer-songwriter Russ Murphy. I just want to say, uh, it's, it's hard to follow. I'm, that is amazing. Thank you so much. Real quick, I'll tell a story. David Spears and I were down in uh, San Antonio, one of the hospitals, and before we sang one night, we saw a little boy reading to his dad because his dad was blind, soldier, and a little girl chopping up her dad's meat because he had his hands blown off. And uh, I wasn't trying to be clever. I stepped back from the microphone and whispered to David, take a look. That's what freedom cost. I always want to write for our soldiers and veterans, but this is also a song for the families of soldiers. A little girl in Cincinnati wishing that her daddy could be there. She's an angel in the Christmas play. Mama fixes up her hair. Daddy's fighting for our country far from home So we'll have to hear about it on the telephone Cause that's what freedom costs, the price that's paid My family's who put roses on a grave From those who wear the wounds of war To the soldiers we have lost that's what freedom costs. That's what freedom costs. A single mom in Houston praying that her son will be all right. Holds this picture to her chest. She won't get much rest tonight. My baby's only 21 years old Dear God, I'm so afraid My blue star will turn gold Cause that's what freedom costs A price that's paid My family's who put roses on a grave From those who wear The wounds of war To the soldiers we have lost that's what freedom costs. Yeah, 
That's what freedom costs. Thinking about my friend Shallow Harris when I wrote this. Man who wife flies look photographs of their wedding day. Such a handsome man. Now there's burns and scars on this for your face. He turns to her. Now tell me what you see. She says, soldier, you're still beautiful to me. Cause that's what freedom cost. My sad face. My family's who put roses on a grave. From those who wear the wounds of war to the soldiers we have lost. Yeah, that's what freedom that's what freedom costs. Yeah, that's what freedom costs. Thank you, all the family. We should have loved Thank you, Russ. Not sure how you better capture sacrifice than telling the story in that song. Uh, we're two minutes out from our flyover. Um, could we please have our Gold Star family stand and raise their hands? Please join me in a round of applause to acknowledge. We owe you a debt that can never be repaid. Your loved one may be gone, but they will never be forgotten. You may take your seats. I'm going to pause before we introduce our next speaker for so that we can uh, enjoy the flyover. That's awesome. I'm told that those are the same World War II planes that Colonel Davis was in, so how fitting. Presenting Gold Star families this morning is the president of the Department of Texas, Oklahoma, American Gold Star Mothers Incorporated, Candy Martin. Candy? Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of this very meaningful and thoughtful event today with the dedication of the Monument of Courage. I believe it is so apropos that we honor Purple Heart recipients, Medal of Honor recipients, and Gold Star families together because our country has witnessed those three categories of heroes since 1775 when patriots fought for American independence. While the Medal of Honor recipients have had the identity since the American Revolutionary War, the Purple Heart recipients and the Gold Star families were never formally recognized until the Great War, or what we now call World War I. I've been asked to just briefly introduce myself. I'm a wife, a mother, a combat veteran, I served in Iraq from 2005 to 2006. I have learned that there is a story behind every star, and today I would like to share just a wee bit about my gold star, my Tom. Although he was offered two separate college scholarships, he chose military service and he enlisted in the United States Army five days after graduating from high school. 
After basic training and advanced training, he became a, a field artillery soldier with his first duty station at Camp Stanley near the DMZ in South Korea. As a young trooper, he learned the real lessons of defending freedom. Number one, he learned that string and concertina wire was a necessity and not at all fun. A lot of you can identify with that. He also learned real quickly that live fire of the MLRSs was no longer a training opportunity. It was real up there in the DMZ. Duty in South Korea near the DMZ was serious, and Tom knew that he wanted to make the absolute best of his military career and serve the absolute best way possible. He applied for, commit for admission to the United States Military Academy. He was accepted, and he graduated from West Point in 2005. After graduation and a lot of young lieutenant training, Tom was on his first and only deployment with the 4th of the 25th Infantry Division out of Fort Richardson, Anchorage, Alaska. He was in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He was part of the 2007 surge. He served as a sniper platoon leader, led his men on approximately 280 dismounted but dismounted missions walking just shy of 1,000 kilometers in his 12 plus months of deployment. His goal was to get his men home alive. Well, he completed that mission. They all came home. Today, we continue a very close relationship with many of those soldiers, something both my husband Ed and I are thankful for. Tom was my firstborn, my only son, and we had that typical mother-son relationship. We were close, but he was my biggest critic, and he would give me that sometimes verbal correction, and I would normally respond with something cute like, I hope your next mother is perfect. For that, I would always get that eye roll. Tom, how well I remember the last face-to-face -face conversation I had with him. He was home on his mid-tour leave, and he was getting ready to go back to his unit in Iraq. It was the morning of April 17, 2007, and Tom and I were enjoying small talk in the kitchen of our San Antonio home. I was telling him all the reasons why I hated for him to go back because I knew that he was experiencing things that no mother ever wanted their child to go through. The conversation went back and forth, back and forth, me with all of my reasoning and him countering my comments with reasons why he should and why he would return to Iraq. It was probably after that fourth round of banter where he left me with a comment that caught me off guard and speechless. He said, Mom, it's what we do. Those four strong words, how could I argue with that? Because I was talking to him as a mother and not as a fellow soldier. His last words still talk to me today. It's what we do. He was raised in a military family and as far back as we can trace, Many in our families have off answered that call to defend freedom. It's what we do. And the more I think about his comment, I believe that he was referring to so much more than our family of heritage that serve. I believe his comment made reference to all of those who answered the call to defend freedom. People like all of you here today to dedicate this monument of courage combat veterans, Purple Heart recipients, Gold Star family members, Medal of Honor recipients and families. What a bunch of heroes. I will tell you that I am thankful for organizations like American Gold Star Mothers, a 92-year-old organization of Gold Star moms whose mission is to turn their sorrow into service and find ways to make life better for veterans and their families. I'm thankful for organizations like Purple Heart Societies all around the United States, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, American Legion, 
Patriot Guard writers, I see their flag right over there, and foundations like the Herschel Woody Williams Medal of Honor Foundation who make way for events like this so that we, the American people, cannot and will not ever forget about those who paid the ultimate sacrifice in service to our country. I'm thankful that because we live in the greatest country in the world, that my son will never be forgotten. Long after I'm gone, very few, very few will remember Candy Martin, a mom. But when people walk through the National Cemetery where First Lieutenant Thomas Michael Martin is laid to rest, I know he's going to be remembered. When Americans look at Gold Star Family Monuments, and soon you're going to see it, it's the big one underneath that black drape, how can you not feel what the families feel? Underneath that drape is an empty cutout, symbolizing the emptiness of a service member saluting that final salute. It will really get you when you see it. The empty space you, you will see could be someone's daughter, son, father, mother, brother, sister. Medal of Honor recipient from the Battle of Iwo Jima, Herschel Woody Williams had a vision, a vision to help educate Americans on who Gold Star family members are. Part of his vision came from a conversation with a Gold Star dad who told Woody, dads cry too. So his vision is just amazing how much it's touched. So far, there have been 61 Gold Star Families National Memorial Monuments across the United States. There are 78 in progress. After today, those numbers will change to 62 completed monuments and 77 in progress. Woody Williams Foundation and the Foundation's goal is to have monuments like this in all 50 states. We're at 48 and still going strong. Thank you to Danny Koch, Steve Oyen, and Benny Guerrero, who are now honorary board members of the Herschel Woody Williams Medal of Honor Memorial Foundation and your entire Lubbock area team to make this possible. Not long ago, a young soldier who served under my son once said to me, you belong to the organization whose members are chosen by God. He was referring to American Gold Star Mothers. However, I keep in touch with JP, and now that talk and his thoughts have changed to include all of you here Medal Heart, the Purple Heart recipients, Medal of Honor recipients, as well as the Gold Star fathers, sisters, brothers, husbands, wives, not just the moms. We are family. We are the chosen ones. So family, please know that what you do with the path you have been led to is up to you, each one of you. Often self-contained grief is self-destructive. And I encourage you each to find your way, redefine that purpose, get out of that comfort zone, and know that you are not alone. And above all, know that our loved ones will never be forgotten. Tom's last conversation with me is a gentle reminder of what I should do as an American. Mom, it's what we do. My hope is that you share my sentiments and that last conversation that I had with my only son. So in closing, I want to thank you again for allowing me and my husband to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And won't you join me in living a life of service? After all, it's what we do, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Candy. At this time, we ask those who are participating, participating in the unveiling to make their way to the Monument of Courage.
Ready, Danny? Unveiling the Purple Heart Monument are the Purple Heart recipients Nick Murphy and Scott Lilly. Unveiling the Medal of Honor Monument. I'm sorry, I don't have that page, Danny. Ready to unveil the Gold Star Monument, Danny? It, I, I don't have those names either. I'm sorry. You'll have to announce those. All Gold Star families. All, all Gold Star families are here to unveil the uh, Gold Star Monument. Flowers will be placed by Gold Star families. Hey! 